He's here to discuss his mentors and what he learned through a remarkable life in music. He is performing late today with his band String Madness. Please welcome Mitch Greenhill and Raised by Musical Man. Thank you and, and thanks for coming out this morning. Um, I'm 73 years old and I've been involved in really it took some, it took some surviving to get here. Uh, and I've been involved in the music, the music and the music business for just about all my life. And uh, I don't know about you, but when you get to be my age, you kind of try to start making sense of it all. It's, uh, it's, I think it's a natural human trait to try to make sense of the senseless. And um, in my case, I'm a member of the me generation. That means uh, I've been working on a memoir. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet I'm not the only baby boomer in this room or on this campus who's been thinking about a, a memoir. Um, so it's, it's in process. Today I'll be sharing some of the stuff I've been working on. I'll be reading from it and uh, showing you some images and playing some clips. Um, in my case, I was raised by a community, and, and by that I don't mean like the guy at the grocery store, or the guy at the post office, or the FedEx delivery person. Um, I was raised by a community of musicians. Um, they taught me life lessons, and they set me on the wayward path that I've been on since. And uh, I'm going to be talking about, about them. It, it was, um, so the, it's called Raised by Musical Mavericks, and um, I don't know if you can see it, these are the uh, various chapter titles, uh, some of the musicians who uh, came through my life and into my house were people like Doc Watson, Lightning Hopkins, Reverend Gary Davis, um, Michael Thompson makes a brief appearance in there somewhere. Um, and this all happened, well here's, here's the setup, I'm a city kid, I grew up on the streets of Boston, and in the, largely in Boston subways. And um, at a certain point, when I was about 13 years old, my father uh, changed his career. He decided to start presenting folk music concerts. Uh, here he is with some scruffy folk singer that he was presenting early on in Boston. And um, managing artists, uh, here he is with Joan Baez, uh, living a good life in the south of France. So these, and this was, um, you know, if that were to happen today, probably these people would have stayed in hotels when they came to Boston. But the scene was a lot um, looser then, and many of them stayed at our house. They stayed in our guest room, and my bedroom was, they had to cross past my bedroom on their way to the bathroom, so I pointed them many a time. Um, in addition to, to Dylan and, uh, Joan and some of the people I've been mentioning. There was a, the first guy who kind of got us singing and thinking about the world in a different way. It was Pete Seeger. In the summer of 1957, our family travels west to Lenox, Massachusetts, where we attend a concert by the Weavers. At this point, the quartet, Pete Seeger, Lee Hayes, Ronnie Gilbert, Fred Hellerman, is several years removed from the, the days of its hit recordings, Good Night Irene and Sing It Sing, when they topped the music charts. And this is just about 18 months past the sold-out concert in Carnegie Hall that probably marked their peak as both artists and influences. If you're looking for the start of the folk revival, that's probably as good a place as any to start. After the concert, Manny Greenhill, my father, and Pete Seeger have a long and serious conversation. My mother, my sister, and I sit a few rows back from them in Tanglewood's barn auditorium, open to the steamy Berkshire summer that hovers just beyond the men's words. We listen as Pete explains that he has a problem. The McCarthy-era blacklist is causing local presenters to cancel confirmed bookings. 
He wants to find a New England presenter who will follow through, who will resist the pressure, who won't bail. I'm your man, and if he says, I won't bail. He agrees to present Seeger's next Boston appearance. <clears throat> Some 45 years later, when people are more like that, I'm assembling a history of folklore productions, my dad's company. And uh, I, I send a letter to Pete. He responds by calling on the phone. He tries to remember the details. He says, I was reaching out to give concerts in different cities. As he talks, I picture Pete at the other end of the phone line. I see him in classic Pete pose, head cocked slightly to the right, focusing on some imaginary object in his middle distance field. As he recalls Manny making the commitment to stand up to the pressure that both knew would be coming. These concerns are well founded. Some months later, with the concert booked and advertised, an FBI agent accosts Man Greenhill at the Butler Street trolley stop on his way to work. After identifying himself, the agent asks why Folklore Productions is, painting, is presenting Pete Seeger, a known communist sympathizer, in concert. Manny shrugs to cover his nervousness. He sells tickets, is his reply, as feigning nonchalance he returns to his crossword puzzle. After my father's death in 1996, I request his FBI files and find that someone in our Dorchester neighborhood has been informing on the comings and goings to and from our home at 402 Street. The Bureau knows much about our household and is protecting the Republic by keeping a watchful eye. Quote, Boston informants have been unable to identify Greenhead in connection with Communist Party affairs in the area and extended surveillance on the subject's place of business and residence disclosed no significant activity, end quote. The report is classified confidential because it contains information from concealed sources of continuing value, it says. The identities of whom would impair their future usefulness, usefulness to the prejudice of the security interests of the United States. It further notes that the subject of surveillance was thoroughly uncooperative. <laughs> a few weeks after the encounter at the trolley stop with the concert just hours away, Pete takes me ice skating. It's not a formal skating rink with manicured ice and a rail to mark its boundaries. It's a temporary play area in the neighborhood tradition. When the weather turns cold, the fire department opens a hydrant near a low stretch of marshland to form an ice pond for winter. The ice is rough and uneven. Bushes jut out from beneath its surface. At one end sits a small wooden cabin heated to provide respite from the New England winter. To tell the truth, I'm not much of an ice skater, and I'm quite sensitive to cold weather, so I usually spend as much time in the cabin hunkered next to the heat as I do on the ice. But today I'm following Pete Seeger, the Pied Piper of Song, who loves the ice and seems impervious to the cold. He leans his lanky frame into graceful turns around the bushes. His scarf trails in his breezy wake, and an equally colorful wool cap protects his thinning hair. I struggle to keep up and actually make some progress. I don't feel as cold as usual, and at times, emulating Pete, I almost seem to feel the rhythm of ice skating. An early lesson. Find the rhythm, brave the cold, balance. Back home, it's more excitement than our little corner of Dorchester is used to. Pete's banjo rings through the rooms, and one afternoon, the University of Massachusetts student, a tall young black man who calls himself Taj Mahal, takes a break from his studies in animal husbandry to stop by and pay his respects. I will eventually become Taj's booking agent, but that's a quarter century into the future, and for now, we're both trying to digest the new musical banquet laid before us. And the concert, it's wonderful and a big success. Sitting in the audience, I find it thrilling, even empowering, to harmonize labor songs with Pete. He has a compelling way of leading a group of people while at the same time submerging himself into one part of a larger whole. It's magical to be both his follower and his singing companion. And his instrumental chops are formidable. We hear both the high sparkle of his long neck banjo and the low rumble of his 12 string guitar. As an added bonus, he brings out a big axe and chops an actual log on stage while singing the work song. <laughs> Nor does he disappoint those who expect a political critique. At one point, he has us all singing that we will own the banks made of marble. 
And, we lead, and when he leads us in Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land, he, conclude, he includes the verse about the sign that says private property on one side and nothing on the other side. He includes that that side was made for you and me. <laughs> Pete is a door to a new world, a world in which we live as we sing in harmony, a world in which injustices are addressed and made right, a world held together by common interests and by music. I want to live in that world. And Spade Jordan Hall, home of the August New England Conservatory of Music, is sold out. The book was gave me a lot of free publicity, Peter, with Pizza and Will Chatham years later. Um, Pete's first day at our Dorchester home with the concert, the ice skating and all, helps me see music as a communal enterprise. We are a group of people gathered around a sonic park. Pete returns to our house a number of times, he usually brings Toshi and the kids, Dan and Tina, and Tina and Nika. Times the house seems to be bursting with cedars. At one time, Pete brings his mother, who warns us against the evils of chlorinated water. <laughs> Many years later, after I join my father in the business, and especially after Dan's wife, Martha, begins to work as Manny's assistant, Pete and Toshi will stop by the office in Santa Monica. We walk to the Santa Monica Pier for a lunch of crab sandwiches. Pete allows himself a beer and then, uncharacteristically, another. In the afternoon sunny breeze, he reminisces about his father, the folklorist Charles Seeger, who showed him the path to traditional music. Toshi thinks that Charles developed a machine to more accurately render the vocal decorations and mannerisms of the old-time singers, and she wonders if it may be in a basement at UCLA, a few miles away. But we never get around to exploring that lead. One year, we present Pete Seeger yet again at the Santa Monica Civic Center. The last time I see Pete, we are at Brooklyn College, observing Woody Guthrie's 100th birthday with a concert that includes the cosmetics whom I now mention. This isn't um, that concert. This is the Clearwater Festival which Pete started up on the Hudson uh, around the same time. And actually, you can see a couple of the cosmetics in that picture. And uh, on the right, that's my son, Matt, who's now running the company with me. Toshi is in a wheelchair now, and Pete and Tina take turns wheeling her, much as she used to wheel, wheel baby Dan around Washington Square Park. As he does virtually every time that our paths cross, Pete remembers ice skating with me and marvels that I look a bit different than I did in 1957. <laughs> if music is a calling, it is Pete as much as anybody who calls me. But he's not the only one. He's rather first in a series. In the years to come, other powerful musicians will sleep in our guest room, eat my mother's pot roast, and most crucially, play music on the living room couch. One song that sticks with me is the gospel song that you know that uh, wonders how I got over it. How I got over, how I got over. To the extent that I ever do get over it is due in large part to what these influential artists are willing to share with a curious kid drawn to their music. with the jacket and tie that he wears even to breakfast. One gnarled hand grasps a cup, the other his white cane. Then he softens and continues in a mock pleading tone, Will you please sanctify my coffee? <laughs> if he weren't blind, he'd swear he winks as he growls, Sanctify. Why, well, certainly, Reverend, replies my mother, knowing her part, and she gently pours a shot of whiskey into her breast. <laughs> That ongoing dialogue, a secular call and response, 
sits at some removed but not entirely divorced from how I imagine Reverend Davis in the pulpit interacting with the congregation. Reverend Davis can employ a number of indirect tactics to realize his objectives. One afternoon, the phone rings. My father answers, so I hear him talking to the proprietor of Wurlitzer Music downtown on Boylston Street. It seems that Reverend Davis has taken a fancy to a Gibson J200 guitar, one of the classiest flat tops available, and will not let it out of his grasp. He sits in the center of the store playing the guitar, caressing it, talking to it. The proprietor says he's upsetting the customers, certainly upsetting the proprietor. <laughs> he says to call you, you're good for it, says the proprietor. Manny Greenhill says okay, authorizing the $500 purchase. And so Reverend Davis and Miss Gibson begin a long and fruitful relationship. There she is. A couple of hours later, he brings it home, and my eyes grow wide. It is the biggest and shiniest guitar I've ever seen, maybe twice as big as my father's little nylon job. As to the cash my father has advanced, Better I owe you money than you owe me money, Davis says. <coughs> Again, with that implied wink, and that's part of the deal. For me, the payback is plentiful. Reverend Davis, having over the years developed a blind man's need to keep his possessions in hand, does not let Miss Gibson slip from his grip. He sits on our living room couch and plays for hours. When I ask, he breaks down his technique as fully as any <coughs> academic I will encounter a few miles north at Harvard College. I'm in my early teens by now. I'm starting to get interested in girls. Reverend Davis should be just the right advisor for worldly matters. One day, I had a date to meet Sandy Rosenthal downtown. We were both taking classes at Boston Children's Theater and, truth be told, had engaged in a little necking and petting at parties. Okay, I've admitted it now. <laughs> Don't tell her father. <laughs> But when Reverend Davis begins to play, I find it hard to leave. I know I have made a commitment to be elsewhere, but then Davis starts singing, playing Samson and Delilah, or Crucifixion, or even, if Mrs. Davis isn't with him, secular songs like Candyman, or Cocaine Blues, or even... Baby, let me lay it on you. Baby, let me lay it on you. I give you everything in the God Almighty world, baby, if you just let me lay it on you. Be sure. Please, ma'am. This is what we call the Holy Blues. Well, I give you everything in the God Almighty world, if you just let me. Please, ma'am. That's what I meant to be, ma'am. <laughs> I guess I lose track of the time. Eventually, Sandy calls to ask where am I and what about our date. I'm trying to answer her, but at the same time, Davis is playing some amazing guitar and his gravelly voice fills the household. Sandy is not amused. Would you please turn down the radio and tell me what's going on? She yells, trying to be heard over the music. But, but that's just it, I stammer. It's not the radio, it's him. He's playing here and now. It's not the last time I wish I could be at two places at once. I want to keep my date with Sandy. Occasionally I make vague moves in that direction, looking for my keys, once even putting on my jacket. My adolescent hormones are telling me to go. It was only last weekend in the back seat of Charles Atwell's Ford that I got to second base with her. Maybe this time I can get farther. But Reverend Davis's holy blues will not let me do it. I never get to that appointment, and uh, I never get to lay much of anything on Sandy Rosenthal. <laughs> Torn and embarrassed, I take off my jacket and resume what now seems to clear to be my necessary position as a member of Reverend Davis's Amen Choir. In my own struggle, the metaphorical Sunday morning has won out over Saturday night. My eyes are fixed on Reverend's meaty hands as they tame, cajole, and stimulate that big guitar. The door that Pete Seeger showed me Perhaps this is where I walk through it and choose the musical world on the other side. But now that world seems a bit more complex and intricate. Its hairpin turns need to be navigated with subtle skills I do not yet possess. 
I must become a better student, more focused, more dedicated. Reverend Davis's unique style derives, as he testifies, from my own origination, is what he says. Let me show you. Both hands attack the strings, the thumb. Here, here's how he makes a C7 chord. I mean, we used to make a C7 chord like that. But he's going to put his thumb over not only the bottom string, the bottom two strings. string is covered, but it's not with a bar. So he uses that on Samson. Blindness does not prevent him from discerning. See if you can tell the difference between this E on the first string. Here's, uh, here's E on the first string open. Here's E on the second string, fifth fret. And here's E on the third string, ninth fret. Same note, but uh, Davis, you know, without any eyes, could certainly hear it in a second. A couple of years later, I take a formal lesson from him uh, at his second floor apartment in New York City's northern reaches. This is where the old uh, 3rd Avenue L went, if you remember. An elevator train, uh, that train occasionally just goes past the window and we pause until it passes. As the train's metallic clatter recedes, we resume. Reverend Davis is showing me his unique finger picking pattern that he employs on Candyman. In a sense, it reverses Travis picking. You know, Travis picking, you go low string, high string. This one goes high string, low string. Kind of like uh, you know, rubbing your head and patting your belly at the same time. Observant than the Reverend. The Reverend moves at will between Saturday night and Sunday morning, at least when she's not around. In her presence, he invokes the Gospels, uh, including the Armageddon, King, Book of Revelations, and Twelve Gates of the City, which we heard earlier. He's sure that he will meet his mother in Galilee. But back in Boston, on the road as a traveling musician, he likes a good party, a stiff drink, and a pretty girl. He's always sidling up to some Juan Radcliffe student and putting his hand on her knee as he attempts to get to know her better. Here his blindness is helpful, but he can't see, he must feel. Many years later, I asked one such beauty if the Reverend ever scored with one of these ladies. Oh no, I don't think so, she recalls with a secret smile. Reverend Davis's lessons include paradoxes and contradictions. The worlds of the spirit and the flesh comprise two distinct but related keys within a musical passage. Eventually, it's the secular key that unlocks the door to financial success as his songs are discovered and recorded by the likes of the Rolling Stones, Jackson Brown, and Bob Dylan. Dylan calls Davis one of the wizards of modern music. Amen. The proceeds flow first to my dad's company, then on to the Reverend and Mrs. Davis, who purchase a brick house in Queens, the first and only home that they own. Mrs. Davis manages to overlook any contradictions in accepting from such questionable sources. In my later teenage years, my father and I visit them there. Manny needs to go over some business with Reverend Davis, perhaps a recording contract, perhaps the matter of that $500 loan from Miss Gibson, which remains outstanding. I want to check in with Miss Gibson, pick up some new musical pointers. 
We find Davis a good deal heavier. He has begun to eat well and often. His expanding belly a testament to his art, his business acumen, and his perseverance. The business concluded we are offered some light refreshment. The good reverend sits back and fires up a cigar, draws deeply on it, and then exhales. The smoke curls first around the lace lampshade and up to the ceiling of his very own living room. It's a long way from the Carolina streets where, as blind Gary, he first began to sing for a living. Those secular songs, blues, and party tunes were his first meal ticket before religion opened another door to a different passageway. And now, as neatly as any leftist college student in his Ivy League audience, he has synthesized the dialectic. It's a lesson in the winding road that music can send one on, the lesson of Saturday night and Sunday morning, and the lesson in the power of conviction and commitment as tools for navigating the paths, curves, and contradictions. Whenever I encounter Reverend Davis, he presents himself confidently as a powerful agent of art. I never see him nervous or unsettled. On more than one occasion, I even see him fall asleep on stage. The next day, I'm back in my bedroom, hunted over my Gibson J45, still trying to decode Candyman. <laughs> This one's sporting a daily southwestern pattern. It's a marked departure from a few decades ago when the body of Merle Watson, Doc's son and music partner, was dressed in a tuxedo that he hated and hardly ever wore. A few feet away in the front row are Doc's brothers, David, who lives nearby, and Lenny, who flew in from Oklahoma. Beside them are Doc's uh, granddaughter, Karen, and her children. Doc's daughter Nancy and grandson Richard, both battling health problems, visited early before the crowds arrived. And what a crowd. Some men are dressed in overalls, but many like me and others whom Doc touched and influenced now gathering on the dais next to the minister wear dark suits. The ladies occupy a similar spectrum between work clothes and special clothes. My flight from California was an easy jaunt compared to the two young guitar players who were the two young guitar players who arrived bleary-eyed after a trek from Japan. Others closer drove. There were college students, farmers, truck drivers, guitar aficionados. 
find myself looking at the lifeless body. In my limited experience, I've never felt comfortable in the presence of an open casket. It's not a tradition in the world that I come from, and I generally find that it makes me feel further away from rather than closer to the dearly departed. I, after all, will walk out of Laurel Springs Baptist Church. Doc, on the other hand, will be carried by Paul Bearers, including me. After we lay him in the Carolina clay, David Watson will take my hand and assure me we'll meet him again. But now, as I look at his prone remains encased by flowers in a wooden box, I find myself thinking back to any one of a hundred conversations. I'll dial the number he'll pick up. How's Doc, I begin. I'll not complain, he responds. How's Mitchell? And we're off. First, we talk business. My company, Folklore Productions, has been representing him since 1964, when Ralph Rensler handed the job over to Manny Greenman. But eventually the conversation returns to music or family or how to wire a house. It's hard to accept now that those days have gone, that Doc won't be answering the phone or telling the story or singing about Omi Wise or Milk Cow Blues or Summertime or Honor of Honors, inviting a guitar solo with those magic words, Take it, son. I first meet Doc at the 1963 Newport Festival. I, Newport Festival, I didn't couldn't find a picture of Doc at the 63 Festival, but this was taken around the same time. More closer to here, really. He comes with others, including Tom Ashley, Fred Price, and Clint Howard, who was Ashley on the banjo. Doc's wife, Rosalie, sings, as does his mother, Annie. Rosalie's father, Gabe Carlton, plays the fiddle. It's a portable Watauga County ecosystem right there amidst the mansions and tennis courts of Newport, Rhode Island. And to me, a northeastern city boy just entering college, it provides a window into a beautiful world of southern mountain music, deep family ties, and a close relationship with nature. Later, Doc will lament he can no longer hear the birds and insects of his boyhood, sounds that once guided his sightless wanderings through the Blue Ridge Hills of his youth. As the environment has changed, those creatures have left the area. And once he brings me up short by musing, if my father hadn't bought my uncle's car, I don't know when I'd ever have got to town. In blue boom, boom, 10 miles away from deep death. A short while after Newport, Doc performs at Club 47 in Cambridge. This time, there's no Watauga County ecosystem. Doc plays <coughs> solo. Solo performers are common at the 47, but this is different whole other level of connection, commitment, and musicianship. When Doc tears into Black Mountain Rag, I wonder if the plaster will peel off the walls of that venerable room. And when he sings of Tom Dula, it's clear he feels a personal stake and holds strong opinions on who is to blame for Laurie Foster's murder. He is clearly nourished by some powerful wellspring, even as he eagerly ventures outside its musical boundaries. I think one of my favorite songs from you know, Doc, is the Shady Girl song. And you used to court Rosalie with this song. Oh, yeah, this was her very favorite. Mm -hmm. Cheeks as red as a blooming rose and eyes of the prettiest brown. She's the darling of my heart, sweetest little girl in town. I wish I had a glass of wine and bread and meat for two. I'd set it out on a golden plate and give it all to you. Shady Grove, my little love, Shady Grove, I say. Shady Grove, my little love, I'm bound to go away. Soon recruits his son Merle, named after Travis, to play with him. I encountered them in Lennox, that town in western Massachusetts where Pete Seeger agreed to work with Manny. Manny now runs the Folk Music Concert Series there. And this is where Merle and I, Merle Watson and I begin our friendship. Along with Jeff Mulder, we shoot pool in a wood paneled room deep in the Berkshires. For some reason, pre-plumbing and art pieces are sitting on the firepiece mantel. Jeff is the best pool player and pretty much runs the table while Merle and I chat and get acquainted. On stage, Doc and Merle work their twin guitar magic, melodic lines darting between harmony and counterpoint, clean and precise and heartfelt, ferocious picking, 
is interspersed with ballads that seem as old as dirt. After I joined the family business in California, my relationship with Merle Deepens, he asked me to co-produce a series of albums for the Watson, including the cuts, uh, some cuts that showcase Merle's rock side, like Rangeman Blues. I think that might have been the first tune that I produced for Dr. Merle. your kindling honey I'll build your fire I'll do anything your little heart desires mama and can you tell me who might your manager be can you tell me who your manager be before too many questions can you make arrangements for me just one more time there huh? recordings in Nashville, but some will record elsewhere in Todd, North Carolina, for instance, a short drive from here. There, after one stretch of sessions, Merle and I load the multi-track tape recorder into the back of his van and drive to Nashville. We want to make sure that our mix is accurate to reflect the recording so the machine goes with the tapes. Out of the Blue Ridge we drive, over the Smokies, down into East Tennessee. By nightfall, we're covering the machine with a blanket and carrying big reels of tape into my Nashville hotel room. As I drift off to sleep, I think of the magnetic particles on that tape, patterns etched as notes fly off guitars and into microphones. Sound waves, yes, but it doesn't take too much imagination to see in those ways the highway from Deep Gap and the journey the music has traveled. So now, many years later, after years of recording sessions, business meetings, sets at Merlefest, I'm a good deal older than the Doc Watson I first met. I've experienced the sad honor of serving as Paul Bearer at Merle's funeral as well as Doc's. My own father has passed and I run the family business with my son Matt. Family connections run deep between the Watsons and the Green Hills. Early on, Doc proposed a pact we would never discuss politics or religion. As a spiritually challenged red diaper baby, I could see the logic and I readily agreed. I guess I was the first one to break that agreement, I'll confess, when I spent a few minutes trying to convince Doc to vote for John Kerry rather than George Bush. I'll think on it, he had snorted that chocolate. Then a year or so later, it was Doc's turn. He was concerned not too much with the body politic, but with the prospects for my mortal soul. Hesitantly, as if a bit embarrassed, but still believing and determined, Doc ventured that he could not rest easy until he had shown me the path to salvation. He urged me to seriously consider baptism. I doubt that Doc voted for Kerry, and my soul remains as much at risk as it did on the afternoon of that phone call. But his concern was just the latest of the many deep and important gifts that I received from Doc Watson as a friend and also as a role model. Doc shows me that getting meaning from one's life is more than getting meaning from one's music. His music is embedded in his life, not a part. He is a life in balance and in context. The phone sits silent on my desk. Doc may lo no longer be on this line, but his music still resonates, as do his examples of fair and ethical dealings and fidelity to who he was and where he came from. Maybe in another world he again hears the birds and insects of his youth. Meanwhile, I find myself moving towards the pulpit, having been called to testify on behalf of my friend and mentor to those gathered at Laurel Spring Springs Baptist Church. Outside, the Blue Ridge waits in green anticipation to receive its latest noble son. So that's a sample of what I've been working on, what I've been pondering, and how I'm trying to make sense of what got me here. I think it's a human trait to look for meaning in our experience. I'm not sure I have answers, but I do know that these musical mavericks have walked me through a life of wonder. I'm just a poor wayfarer 
barren stranger while traveling through this world of woe. There is no sickness, toil, or danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm just a go.